Good day, Grade Levens. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. I hope you've had an awesome week so far and that you're ready to work through some two body systems and then move on to Newton's third law and universal law of gravity. Okay, so if you're with me, last time we were speaking about physical science, um, we had a power failure on this end. Um, a very brief power failure. Um, I'm not going to name names, but the council decided to switch off the whole street. Anyway, so the point is that by the time I managed to get the servers back and everything else, um, we basically had ended with a very short lesson. So if you're watching or if you have watched part of that lesson and you saw that we got halfway through the first question, I'm actually going to start again. I'm starting today again with that lesson and I'm going to move through that question again because there's nothing worse <laughs> than not being able to see what is going on because you only had half a lesson I mean half a question being answered and on top of that the reason as I was saying in the last lesson the reason that I do these two body systems in such detail with so many examples is that if you can believe it there are certain things that are more fashionable than others or more on trend than others when it comes to exam paper questions and physical science and at the moment the two body systems are hugely popular with the teachers and the examiners and the reason for that is because of the fact that it never used to be in okay no it used to be in the curriculum in the old ages before you were born then they moved it out of the curriculum and then they brought it back into the caps curriculum but then they didn't actually ask you it in the caps curriculum for the first couple of years and now they've said okay we think you're ready for it now so point is that it's one of the newer type of questions they can ask you so they're very excited about it so it's very popular so that's for that reason i'm going through lots and lots of examples of two-body systems and on top of that i would really urge you guys to practice these teachers love them and um, when I say teachers, I mean the examiners as well. I know this is grade 11, but I'm telling you now, you're preparing for grade 12, so let's get going. Okay, it says, a force of 60 newtons is applied to the five kilogram block at an angle of 10 degrees. Okay, so that's supposedly 10 degrees. To the horizontal, causing the block to accelerate to the left. So there is some form of acceleration to the left. It says the coefficient of the kinetic friction between the five kilogram block and the surface of the table is 0.5. So what are they telling us? Okay, yes, they're telling us that there's a coefficient of kinetic friction, but more importantly, they're telling us that there is a frictional force. There is a frictional force. And it says ignore the effects of air friction. Yay, we can ignore that. First question. It says draw a labeled free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the five kilogram block. Okay, and if you've watched any of these lessons or joined me for any of these lessons, you'll notice that I've always said to you guys, it doesn't matter how many free body diagrams I ask you to draw, I would seriously urge you guys, I strongly recommend it, that you guys draw the free body diagrams for all the objects in the system. <clears throat> when I say all, okay, even though the exam guidelines says that it has to be a two body system, the first time they asked this in a matric exam, there were three bodies. So be prepared, okay? Um, it hasn't happened since, but it can happen. So that is why I say draw free body diagrams for all the bodies in the system. Okay, but they've asked us right now to draw the free, labeled free body diagram of a five kilogram block. So the first thing you need to realize is that a free body diagram is a dot or a colored in circle it's one of my students actually say it's a colored in circle or a dot if you draw a block you immediately just get across through your work because then you are drawing a force diagram and not a free body diagram a free body diagram has to have a dot that actually represents the center of mass but that's beside the point now it says they were showing all the forces acting on the five kilogram block okay so do you agree there's the force of gravity it has to have a force of gravity otherwise it'd be floating off the table and then obviously there is a normal force if normal the force of friction it is accelerating to the left so the force of friction is going to be in the opposite direction so there's going to be a force of friction this way and there's an applied force, if applied, of 60 newtons. And there you go. 
Now, a couple of things. Um, as I always say, when you are drawing your free body diagram, you need to be drawing it in pencil. I obviously don't have that facility. You need to use a ruler, something else I don't have. And you need to use an eraser. So if you make a mistake, you don't end up crossing out part of the line. Okay, so you need to do that. And then obviously it says labeled. And a lot of my students ask, so, well, do we actually have to work out? You know, we know that the force applied is 60 Newtons. Do we actually have to work out what the force of gravity is a normal force, et cetera, et cetera? No, when they say labeled, they just mean that you must tell them which of these forces are. Okay, and again, another hint. Um, in the exams and in your tests, there will be a mark allocation for this. So for example, this one should have a mark allocation of four. And the reason I say that, and the reason what the hint is, is that however many marks there are, that is generally 99.99% of the time, the number of forces, one, two, three, four, the number of forces, okay, that you have to draw. Do you understand? So if, you will have three marks, then you should have drawn, or should be aiming for three forces. If there were five marks, yeah, you need to worry. You think, what have I missed? Okay, right, so that's the first question. Now it says, calculate the magnitude of the vertical component of the 60 Newton force. So they want the 60 Newton can be broken up into a horizontal component and a vertical component and they want the vertical component fv okay now this drawing here should have been a fairly easy level one question well level one is actually memorization this is a level two question i know that so a lot of students still struggle with the free body diagram but this question here is definitely an easy question. It says, calculate the magnitude of the vertical component of the 60 Newton force. This is a 90 degree triangle, so we can easily use Sakatoa. So this line over here, which is the force, is 60 Newtons, and that is the hypotenuse. And they want the vertical component. So we can look at Sakatoa, or oh, silly old hens, cackle and howl till old age. Okay, and we want the opposite side, opposite of 10 degrees. And we've got the hypotenuse, so therefore we're going to use sine. So we're going to say sine of 10 degrees equals the opposite, which is the vertical component, over the hypotenuse of 60. So you've got 60 sine 10 degrees is equal to the vertical component of the force. So we need our calculators. Sure. Okay, but lots of things open today. Um, let me just see if I can just, hang on a minute, if I can get here and just close this quickly. Sorry, I did lots of work before this for a change. Okay, right, so let's clear. Okay, so we want 60 sine 10, and you know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, check that this does not have a big R here for radians. You need to be in degrees. So we go 60 sine 10 degrees, close bracket equals, and that's 10.4, always have to round up to two decimal places, is 10.42. So the vertical component is 10,42 Newtons. Okay, so that's 10,42 Newtons. Right. Um, Guys, you can use the sign rule. I know that a lot of you prefer using the sign rule. That's fine. Um, I personally prefer using Sakatoa. Okay, the next question says, calculate the magnitude of the horizontal component of the 16 Newtons. So again, an easy question. We're going to now look for the horizontal component. So if we're looking for the horizontal component, we're going to have to use cars because the horizontal component is adjacent and we've got the hypotenuse. Now again, some of you might go, well, why aren't we using Pythagoras? We've got 60, we've got 10.42. Why, why, why aren't we using Pythagoras? Well, for one reason, we rounded this 10.42 up. So there's already an element of error in that. It's not as accurate as we'd like it to be. Secondly, let's say you messed up on your calculator. Maybe you messed, wrote, for some reason, you wrote 60 sine 
is nine degrees and you've got the wrong answer here. If you then use this wrong answer in the next part of the question, you get compounded error, compounded error, compounded error. And I know you get method marks in science, but seriously, there's only so many method marks they can give you and so far that they can follow your incorrect methods and correct answers. So I would suggest that if you, and this is what I always tell my students, if you can use what they were given originally, and it's so easy to work out the, the this horizontal component using the 10 degrees and the 60 degrees, use that and don't use the number that you worked out in case you worked it out incorrectly. Okay, so we're going to say cos, cos of 10 degrees equals the adjacent, which is the horizontal component over the hypotenuse of 60. So we've got 60 cos 10 degrees equals the horizontal component. So let's just go find that. So we're going to go 60 cos 10 close bracket equals and it's 59 point. Now remember we always run it up to two decimal places. So we look at the third one and that's an eight. So it rounds that up. So it becomes 59.09. So therefore the F horizontal is 59.09 Newtons. And I'm going to write that in 59,09. Right now. And this is the reason they've asked us to work out the components because there's actually a little bit of a trick here. Okay, normally, normally, we would say that the normal force, this normal force, is equal to the force of gravity, right? Normally. But what's actually happening if we look at this free body diagram is that this applied force is doing two things. It is pulling the object to the left or the system to the left, but it's also pulling the object up away from the ground. So therefore we can say that the sum of this plus the sum of this has to equal this. In other words, the vertical component of the applied force plus what would be the normal force, okay, has to equal the force of gravity for the simple reason that if that was not the case then the object would be moving, it would either be moving up or down. Now they said calculate the magnitude of the normal force, the normal force. So what are we doing? We're working out this dude here, but we know it doesn't move vertically, right? So we know that vertically, vertically, F net equals zero. And remember that F net equals the sum of all the forces, right? Of all the forces, some of all the forces. So therefore we can say, well, what are the forces acting on this object vertically? Well, this is the force of gravity plus the normal force plus the force vertical, this vertical component of the applied force, okay? Now I know that I put all pluses because remember the F net is the sum of all the forces. I now need to assign something as positive and negative. It really doesn't matter what we do. So why don't we choose, I don't know, let's choose down as positive. Okay. If we choose, okay, no wait, we're working out the normal force. So why don't we choose up as positive since we're working that one out, okay? So we're going to choose up as positive. Up is positive for this. Okay, on this plane. Left is positive because of in the movement in the left and right plane, but in the vertical plane, up is positive. So we've got F net, which is zero, is the force of gravity, which is going to be minus, because it's negative, the mass of the object, which is five, times by 9.8, plus Fn, plus what is the vertical component? The vertical component of the applied force is 10.42, 10.42. So do you agree then? I can say that minus Fn is going to be minus five times 9.8 plus 10.42. All I've done is taken this Fn and taken it to the other side. And now I need a calculator. So, We've got five times 9.8 equals minus 10.42 equals, and it works out to be 38.58. So Fn 
equals 38 comma 58 newtons. Um, if you're wondering what I did, why it worked out differently is I just swapped the signs. I made 5 times by 9.8 be positive and subtracted the 10.42 comparatively instead of doing it the other way around. Okay, so the normal force is actually 38.58. So this is, wait, wait, 38 comma 58. 38,58 newtons. Okay, now they've said calculate the magnitude of the tension and the strain connecting the two blocks. Okay, so all of that was leading up to this, and I'm going to erase all this because I've written all the information on my diagram. And I also suggest that you guys do that. I mean, obviously, it'd be nice if it's nice and neat and big, okay, and not squished. Um, and the reason for that is because it gives you an overall picture. Okay, it gives you a nice overall idea of what's going on. So before I even think about working out the tension in the string, I'm going to draw another free body diagram. I'm going to draw a free body diagram of the two kilogram. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is a whole system and the two kilogram also comes into play. So for the two kilogram, do you agree there's only two forces? There's the force of gravity down, they've said ignore air friction. So there's the force of gravity down and there's the tension. And I did this in the last thing as well. There is a tension here. There's a tension in this. I forgot about the tension. I'm so sorry. It hasn't come into play yet in this question, but I forgot about it. There is that force there, the tension. Oh, sorry, guys. <clears throat> so... <laughs> Okay, now it says calculate the magnitude of the tension in the string, so please don't forget to put the tension in. Okay, now, so when you're working out the magnitude of the tension in the string, you obviously need to work with the two free body diagrams separately, and you need to realize that the tension being pulled over here is the same as the tension being pulled up there, okay? If it wasn't, then this string would either break or it would be slap, it would be loose, there would be crinkles in it, okay? So, or the, the two kilogram wouldn't be moving as well. Okay, so let's look at the five kilogram block. And we're only considering the horizontal forces. Now, first thing we're going to do is we're going to choose left as positive because it is accelerating to the left, okay? And remember, we're going to go for F net. And F net is the sum of all the forces. And I keep stressing that because there's actually a mark allocated for showing that you know that F net is the sum of all the forces. So let's think. Okay, first of all, we've got the horizontal. Let's just do this in another color so you know what I'm doing. We've got the horizontal component, okay, in towards the left. So that's going to be F H plus, plus, we've got the force of friction. Okay, plus we've got the tension. We'll worry about signs in a minute, but that's what's happening here. We've got the horizontal component, we've got the force of friction, and we've got the tension. And those are the horizontal forces acting on this five kilogram block, the five kilogram block, okay? So now we've chosen to the left as positive. So therefore we can write this as F horizontal, plus minus the force of friction, plus minus T. Okay, and we want T. And this equals mass times acceleration. Okay, so the mass of this object is five kilograms, and the acceleration is A. The horizontal component we've worked out is 59.09, 59,09, plus or minus the force of friction. Now, the force of friction, remember, the formulas on your formula sheet is mu f n, where mu is the coefficient of the kinetic friction and f n is the normal force. And this is why they asked you to work out the normal force. Okay, they were hinting, they were giving you an idea, minus t. So if we've got 5a is equal to 59,09 minus 0,5 times by the force of friction, which is 38,58, okay, minus t. So do you agree that becomes 5a is 
minus, I need to use my calculator for this. So it's 38.58 times 0 0.5 is going to be 19.29, 19,29 minus T. And then we might as well just subtract that now, minus 59.09 is equal to minus 39.8, so it equals 39,8 minus T is equal to 5A. And let's call that equation 1. Okay, now in order to solve this, do you see that there's two variables? There's the variable for A and there's the variable for T. So in order to solve this, we actually need another simultaneous equation and that is why we have to do this free body diagram there. So what you need to realize is that you've got the F net is equal to, now again, if to the left is positive, that means that the up must be positive as well because this is being pulled up, okay? So therefore we're gonna have T plus minus the force of gravity. I've kind of just skipped a step for you guys. So that is gonna be T minus the force of gravity on this, but that's just gonna be two times 9.8. Now let's talk about the net force. The net force is made up of the mass of this object times by its acceleration. But do you agree the whole system has to have the same acceleration? Otherwise this string would break and then there wouldn't actually be a system. So therefore it's going to be 2a. So now we've got 2a is equal to t minus 19.6 in that equation 2. Right, now, they've asked you to calculate the magnitude of the tension, and we could solve each of these for A. We could either divide both of these sides by 5, and then both these sides by 2, and then or we could multiply this by 5 and this by 2 and get rid of the A's and then solve for T, or what we could do is just solve both of these for T, find A, and then substitute back in. Okay, it really doesn't matter which way you go. So I'm going to do it where we're solving for t. So let's write them out. It becomes 5a is equal to 39,8 minus t. Actually, I've changed my mind. I'm going to solve both of them for t. Therefore, t is going to be, well, minus t is 5a minus 39,8. Therefore, T is going to be 39,8 minus 5A. And we're going to call this equation 3. And then if we go back to this color, we're going to have T is equal to 2A plus 19.6, and that's equation 4. So what we're going to do is equate equation 2, 3 and equation 4. So if we do that, we lose the T, so we get 39,8 minus 5A is equal to 2A plus 19,6. So therefore, we've got 7A minus 5 across is equal to 39,8 minus 19,6. And now we need a calculator. So let's get it out. And we've got 39.8 minus 19.6 equals, that's 20.2. So this is 20 comma 2 equals 7a. Therefore, a is equal to, we're going to divide both sides by 7. Divide by 7 equals, and that becomes 2.89. So T A is 2,89. But they didn't ask us to solve for A, they asked us to solve for T. So now we need to substitute A into either equation 4 or equation 3 to get the tension. I'm just going to substitute into equation 4. So you're going to get T is equal to 2 times 2,89 bracket plus 19,6. Let's find that tension. So, because I've rounded it up here, I'm going to use the rounded up version. So, I'm going to go 2 times 2.89 equals plus 19.6 equals, and press the SD button, 25.38. So, therefore, the tension 
in the string is 25.38 newtons. And there you go. Sure. So it's quite a hectic question, grade 11s, and that is why it is so popular at the moment. It is incredibly popular because although it is a hectic question, it is broken up into lots of small bits. So they've, and they also like it because they can cover a whole bunch of your vector analysis and forces and force diagrams and free body diagrams in one fell swoop. So, and most importantly, it covers Newton's second law, if net equals MA. So please guys, make sure you understand how to do this. Okay, please make sure. Okay, so let's do one more example like this. And then I think we're moving on to Newton's third law. Okay, well, we'll get there. So let's just read it and then we'll go through the questions. It says a light inelastic string connects two objects of mass six kilograms and three kilograms respectively. They are pulled up an inclined surface that makes an angle of 30 degrees with a horizontal with a force of magnitude of F. Ignore the mass of the string. It says the coefficient of kinetic friction of the three kilogram and the six kilogram block is 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 respectively. Okay, so first of all, they tell you there's a light inelastic string. So the reason they tell you that is because they're saying it doesn't participate in the reaction. I mean, in the reaction, in the, uh, the problem at all. It doesn't actually make a difference to the problem. Okay, so a light inelastic string means that it is not stretchy, so we can kind of ignore the fat, and it's light, we can ignore the mass. Okay, there's a six kilogram block and a three kilogram block. They're pulled up the inclined surface at an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal horizontal, the force of magnitude F. It says the coefficient of the kinetic friction. So now we know there's force of friction here and there's a force of friction here. Okay, there are two forces of friction. They're obviously different because it's dependent on their mass and their coefficient of kinetic friction. So the first question says, state Newton's second law of motion in words. So guys, Newton's second law of motion words is F net, well, Newton's second law of motion says F net equals mass times acceleration. But if you just write that, you're going to get zero. You actually need to know Newton's second law of motion in words, and you need to know the word perfectly. And I would like to suggest to you that you go and ask your teachers for the exam guidelines, actually grade 12 for the grade 12s, it's called the exam guidelines. But in the exam guidelines, they've got all the definitions that you need to know, and they've got them exactly as you have to know them. So there'll be no doubt that you're actually learning the correct version. But basically, Newton's second law of motion says that if an object experiences a force, then it will accelerate in a way that is directly proportional to force and inversely proportional. So it experiences an unbalanced or net force or resultant force, then it will accelerate in such a way as to be proportional to the force and inversely proportional to its mass. Okay, more or less, or well, basically F net equals mass times acceleration, but it, what it really says in words is that F is proportional to acceleration and that acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. Okay, now it says, but what were they, sorry, what were they really telling us by asking us Newton's second law? They were saying you're going to use Newton's second law in this question. That's what they were really saying. Okay, so now it says draw a labeled free body diagram indicating all the forces acting on the six kilogram block object as it moves up the inclined surface. Draw a label free body diagram indicating all on the six kilogram. So we need to draw on the six kilogram. Okay, so let's get going. So let me try not to forget the tension this time. Okay, so I'm going to draw it over here. So, um, okay, so we've got a free body diagram again. So it's got a colored in dot. Do you agree there's the force of gravity straight up? Okay, I'm going to draw the slope in just to make it easier because the normal force has to be at 90 degrees to the surface and that's F normal. There is the force of friction backwards. Okay, there is the force of friction backwards 
and then there is the tension in the rope forwards. Okay, and it tells you that it's been pulled up the incline with a force of magnitude F, okay, but this is the tension between the three kilogram and six kilogram. And that's it. Those are all the forces acting on this object, okay. Now it says, calculate the tension string if the system accelerates up the incline plane at four meters per second squared. So it's telling you that the system accelerates at four meters per second. And what's nice about this is because we've been given the acceleration, we don't actually need to worry about the three kilogram right now. So let's talk about the forces that are acting on this that are causing it to have a net acceleration. So what you also need to realize is that this force of gravity is doing two things. It is pulling it down into the earth and it's got to an apply the force horizontal down thing. No, wait, so let me try again. The force of gravity is doing two things. It is pulling it down into the ground and it's pulling it down the slope. So we have another force that was implicit in this diagram, which is the force of gravity um, parallel. Okay, the, the parallel component of the force of gravity. Okay, so we need to do a couple of things. The first thing we need to do is work out the force of gravity parallel. But before we do that, I want to write my equation. So let's do that. Uh, if net, remember is the sum of all the forces, and we're going to choose up as positive, since that's the direction it's accelerating in, is going to be the tension plus the force of friction plus the force of gravity parallel, the parallel component of the force of gravity. Okay, so the tension is what we're trying to work out, plus the force of friction. It is negative because it's in the opposite direction. So it's minus mu k Fn, the normal force. And then this is going to be minus the force of gravity parallel. And we need to work out what that is. And the net acceleration, is going to be six times by four because it told us it's accelerating at four. So that's quite nice. So what do we need to do? We need to first work out Fn. Well, you know that Fn is the vertical component because this is Fg perpendicular. So these are equal to this. And then we have to work out the Fg parallel. So I'm going to take this triangle and draw it a bit bigger. So here we go. This here is the force of gravity. That is Fg perpendicular. That is Fg parallel. And this is 90 degrees. And this angle here is 30 degrees because that's the angle of the slope. That's 30 degrees there. That means that this angle here is 30 degrees. Okay, so we know that we can use Sakatoa. Sakatoa. And the FG parallel is going to be the opposite side and the FG perpendicular is going to be the adjacent side. So therefore we can say that this is equal, 6 times 4 is 24, is equal to T, okay, we might as well write minus straight away. Um, minus, the mu K on the 6 kilogram is 0, 0,2. So it is 0, 0,2. Then, if n is the normal component, which is equal to the perpendicular component, and that's adjacent over the hypotenuse, so we're looking at cos. So I could say cos of 30 degrees equals Fg perpendicular over the hypotenuse of Fg. So therefore, we could say that's Fg cos 30 degrees. Okay, you're happy with that. But do you agree that Fg is equal to mass times gravity? Fg is mass times gravity. So therefore, we can say that this is going to be 0 0.2 times the mass of this object, which is 6, times by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9,8 cos 30 degrees, minus the force of gravity parallel which is this bit here, which is that bit there, which is the opposite. So we're going to use sine. So we're going to say sine of 30 degrees is equal to the opposite, which is Fg parallel 
over the hypotenuse, which is FG. Therefore, we've got FG sine 30 degrees. So that becomes M, which is going to be 6 times 9.8 times sine 30 degrees. And grade 11, so don't be shy to write these all down, these workings all down. Obviously, my space is limited because of the fact that I've got this tiny square over here that I have to try and fit all my reasoning and all my working in. You guys have got pages and pages. So don't be shy to show this working properly because remember that there are method marks the whole way through it. And sometimes you work it out in the corner and you don't write it incorrectly in your equation and you could get a method mark for that. So don't hide it. Show what you're doing. Okay. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong. But if you don't show it and you got it and you were doing the right thing, then you can't get the marks. Okay. So please show us your work. So 24 is equal to T. Now let's multiply this out. Okay, so it goes 0 0.2 times 6 times 9.8. Hmm, that did not work. Times 9.8 times cos of 30. Close bracket equals becomes 10.18 so that's 10 comma 18 minus okay let's work this one out so now it's 6 times 9.8 times the sine of 30 close bracket equals 29.4 so therefore, we can just take this all across and we can go, well, therefore, T is equal to 24 plus 10 comma 18 plus 29 comma 4. Okay, and then we need a calculator again. So we can go plus 24 plus 10.18 and that is equal to 63.58. 63.58 what? 63.58 newtons. Okay, remember your units. Seriously, grade 11s, your units are incredibly important. I used to teach or I used to tutor, privately tutor a student who was doing so well in all her extra lessons. I couldn't understand why she was only getting 70, low 70s. And 70s sounds like a very good mark, and it is, but she was hoping to get into medicine, so she needed an A, high A. So eventually I got her to bring, get the teacher to let her bring her exam script home. And do you know that she was losing over 10% in her exams just because she forgot to put the units in every time? So please, grade 11s and grade 12s, if you're watching this grade 12s, please remember to put your units in. It is so silly to do this huge problem, get it all right, and then just because you either don't put the units in or you don't put the direction in, you actually get the mark incorrect. Okay, so please, please, please remember to put your unit in. Okay. Now it says, whoopsie, so that's 63.58, right? Now it says, and I can't see anything because they're writing all over it, so let's just erase the drawings. And I lost it. There it is. Okay, it says, how would the tension in the string calculated in the previous question be affected if the system accelerates up a frictionless, a frictionless inclined plane at four meters per second squared. Write down only increase, decrease, or remains the same. Okay, well, let's think about this. If there was no friction, if there was no friction, okay, let's use green. What would happen? If there was no friction, this mu k would go away. Do you agree? So, the, in fact, the whole of this, this would go away. So, therefore, that would go away, and therefore that would go away, and therefore the tension in the string would be much less. Do you agree? It actually would be, what is that? That's 4, 9, 4 is 13, carry 1, that's 53. So it is obvious that if there is no tension, but it's still been accelerated at 4 meters per second squared, the tension, I mean, if there's no friction and it's still been accelerated at 4 meters per second squared, the tension is going to decrease, which makes sense because you'll need less force to pull it up the hill. Okay, happy. Right, let's move on. 
Right now, Newton's third law, and we're almost finished the end of the, this. I'm almost at the end of this lesson, but I'm still going to start Newton's third law because it's actually quite an easy law. Okay, so Newton's third law. Newton's one and two applies to a single object on which one or more forces are acting. Okay, Newton one says basically that if an object is stationary and we push it with a resultant force, it's going to start moving, right? Or if an object is moving at a constant velocity, it will stay like that unless we push it with a resultant force. That's what Newton's first law says, okay? Basically, we've pushed something, something will happen as long as it's a net force. Newton's second law quantifies that. It says, well, actually, if you push it with a certain force, then that object will experience an acceleration that is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. In other words, the heavier the object is, the less it's going to accelerate with that force. That's really what it's saying. So Newton 1 and 2 apply to a single object, right? Newton 3 is applicable to where two objects interact with each other. Okay, two objects. For example, a man is pushing a motor car, or two people greet each other, they shake hands, or a horse is pulling on a cart. Okay, so those are examples of where Newton 3 is applicable. So it's where two objects interact with each other. And that's why people sometimes get confused. They'll say, okay, fine, well, how can a rocket be going moving forward in space if there's Newton 3, which is cancelling out the forces? But there's two totally different objects, things happening here. Newton 2 is the forces on a single object, and Newton 3 is between two objects when they interact each other, on each other. Finally, when you stand on the floor or sit on your desk or sit on your chair or lean on your desk, okay, there are still two objects interacting with each other. So Newton's third, third law. Now, I know that you guys have learned um, the typical um, for reaction is an equal and opposite reaction. But unfortunately, they have decided that you can't write that. If you write that, in the exams, you're going to get it wrong. And that's because if you read Newton's original document, he actually put some provisos in that actually make it true. If I just say to you, for every action is equal to opposite reaction, it's not strictly true because you're not understanding the full context of it. So they've changed it so that it is perfectly correct for any context, okay? And it says, when object A exerts a force on object B, then object B exerts an equal but opposite force on object A. And guys, you need to know your laws word perfect. Seriously, I would suggest you take little cards and you write the laws down on the one side and the name of the law on the other side, and then you play patience with yourself or something and you learn the laws. Seriously, make a plan. Up to 10% of the exam papers, both of them independently, physics and chemistry, can be made up of the laws. That's another 10% that you can easily find. Okay, so just writing in your units and your directions when you've got vectors, and units always, vectors, directions, and knowing your laws, you can guarantee yourself at least 20%. Obviously, you, you, oh, by the way, you cannot just write the unit in, you actually have to write the answer first, but that's beside the point. Okay. Right, action reaction pairs. Okay, so you know what? I'm going to leave action reaction pairs for our next lesson on Thursday. Um, so we'll start here on action reaction pairs. In fact, I will just go back to this and explain it to you again, and then we'll talk about action reaction pairs because this requires quite a bit of time. Have a great day, and I hope to hope that you guys join me on Thursday. 